The BC election day is coming up here on October the 19th, and understandably, all the parties have released their official plans for the province with housing front and center. The NDPs and the Conservatives are mostly in the limelight, so we're going to dissect their housing platforms, outlining which ideas actually look good for housing in BC and which ones might just be pipe dreams. Plus, the September stats are out and we are going to share what's going on within our fall market and just how far prices have fallen. Let's dive right into it. So this week, we are going to cover the conservative housing platform. And there's lots to go over, so we'll keep it just to one episode here, and then we'll do our thoughts on the NDP's housing platform next week, still prior to the election. Okay, so the conservative housing platform. Read this whole thing top to bottom. Uh, they spend about the first quarter of their plan just taking shots at the NDP. I mean, you know, it's, I, I get politics that way. It felt a little excessive, but whatever. Let's move on into the actual details here. The thing that they seem sort of the most proud about, what's right at the top here, is what they call the Rustad rebate, which is, quote, the largest tax cut on housing costs in BC history. The largest. Okay, well, let's see how large it actually is. So beginning with the budget in 2026, they're going to take $1,500 per month of either your rent payment or your mortgage interest and strata fees and make them exempt from your income tax. Okay, the exempt amount will then increase by $500 per year until it reaches $3,000 a month. Okay, sounds pretty good. So far, I like it. In year one of the plan, 2026, by the end of that year, you'll be able to offset your employment income to the tune of $18,000, right? 15K a month times 12, 18,000. Uh, looking up the average salary in British Columbia, it says it's around $62,000 per year right now. The provincial taxes currently on that salary, provincial taxes are 2,720 bucks a year. So if you take that 62K of employment income and reduce it by the tax cut down to 44,000, you're now paying provincial taxes of $1,462. So with his plan, you will save about $1,260 a year. So $105 a month. So $105 a month is the biggest tax cut on housing in BC history, apparently. I haven't quantified that to see if there was any larger, but could you imagine if that was actually true? That's the biggest we've ever seen. But let's expand on this further. So as it grows at $500 per year, uh, by the year 2029, you'll be able to offset $36,000 a year in your employment income if you're still earning that same $62,000 for round number's sake, which means you would now pay $1,012 in provincial taxes. That is a $1,700 annual savings or $142 a month. I mean, it's, it's something, right? Like what I do like about this plan is it, ultimately it's relatively easy to implement a tax cut and any tax cuts, of course, are welcomed, right? It's so rare that we seem to get them in this province and in this country that this might be something. Um, I guess my immediate concern might be is that, well, the government obviously needs this income, right? I mean, they're already operating at what a $5 billion a year deficit projected to grow up to about $9 billion a year deficit. So while tax cuts are needed and required, I'd like to see a little bit further of this uh, process thought out here as to where maybe the other revenues are coming from or what they're going to cut back on to not need this revenue. Ryan, what's your take on this first uh, sort of policy? Yeah, well, you, you bring up an interesting point. Uh, so much so that, you know, when you're looking at <laughs> when you're when you're when you're considering the largest tax cut and you're doing it in terms of a monetary value as opposed to a percentage value it doesn't really ring true to me because at that point you know we're we're dealing with fixed money costs and as we go into the future you know we know that inflation is a big problem you know we know that our currency gets debased i mean at the end of the day i it just doesn't really help too too much i mean think about this for example uh, you know over the last couple of years we saw rent every month you know go from what 1800 bucks a month to you know or 1500 bucks a month to 3000 like we've seen it double right and you know we're going to get 140 dollars back every month I don't know how that really helps. It might buy you a half a bag of groceries, right? So, you know, these these kind of tax cuts, I I really feel are they don't really do much unless you you compound them with 
uh, an actual cut, like a budget cut. You just talked about how the budget is in, you know, intended to go from 5 billion deficit to 9 billion deficit. Well, is that because we're deciding to do every single social program, every single program that the government wants to do in development? Where are the cuts? Where's the balancing? It's not just going to come from taxing people more and more and more. You have to do a better job of actually running the budget itself. So for me, you know, I'm not a huge fan of tax rebates. That also means you have to spend in order to get. And uh, I would prefer to just see a clawback when it comes to the effective tax rates that we pay in BC. So that to me would be a meaningful tax cut. This is uh, somewhat political in, in my opinion. So um, the last thing I'll also say yeah. too is just like the, these things, like this tax cut doesn't actually help incentivize people, right? Imagine like some of the things we're hearing down in the South, uh, like, you know, not taxing tips for servers or, you know, having a look at overtime and saying, hey, listen, we're going to tax you at the effective rate for the first 40 hours of your work week. But if you work an extra 20 hours, that additional overtime rate is going to be at a lower tax rate. That's something that will increase productivity that we need desperately in this country. So if we're not getting cuts and, and we're getting rebates, it's a bit of lip service. Yeah. Ultimately too, it's, it's just, it's doing nothing for affordability. It's keeping people in their homes, which again helps maintain the price of real estate, which apparently is sort of the somewhat not so hidden agenda anymore. But uh, I digress. I, I agree with you. So uh, let's let's look at their approval process ideas. So we all know the delays uh, at City Hall uh, for permit approvals has taken a long time. In fact, in many instances, it's probably the leading cause of uh, the lack of housing in this province. In fact, delays are so costly, it's forcing developers into foreclosures and parcels of land are being sold off after years of indecision by council members. Sold to the next developer to start the process all over again. And guess what they have to do? They have to pay more fees to the city so that they can start their process. So approve. So what they're saying is approve homes in months, not years. Six months for rezoning and development permit, three months for building permit. We don't really need to go any further. Do you remember the current mayor, Ken Sims' uh, promise? He campaigned on a 3331 approval, time work, uh, approval framework. Sorry, That meant three days for home renovation permits, including renovations to accommodate mobility uh, and accessibility related challenges, three weeks to approve a single family or townhouse permit, three months to approve permits for professionally designed multifamily and mid rise projects where existing zoning is already in place, and one year to approve permits for high rise or large scale projects. This sounds pretty familiar. Well, guess what? If you look at the city website, this permit approval process was formally adopted in 2023 in June of 2023, 16 months ago, and it's not working. So do you talk to any developer? Do you talk to them that has a, a DP or a BP with the city? And they'll tell you they are not seeing these approvals in these timeframes. So while these, it may have improved, I'll, I'll say, but it hasn't gotten to these timeframes. So while these are all fantastic ideas, we need to have permits approved faster, Rustad just appears to be looking like he's making the promises that we've already heard before. I'm not sure he can speak to the nuances either. Uh, there's a lot of nuances in these process approvals. And so it's his answer to that. Uh, well, quote unquote, if a clear yes or no is not issued by City Hall within the required time frames, then the provincial government will issue the permits. <laughs> okay. So another government body is going to look after the government body that's not doing it. It doesn't sound like a real level of accountability here. Can you imagine just for a second what it would take to undertake something like that? I'm surprised they aren't using technology. Like you've got up in Kelowna, you've got a pilot project being run by AI at the permit approval city uh, or at the uh, approval process where AI looks to see if you've actually created an application that fits within the framework, and then you can get your permit approval pretty quickly. I mean, 
where's maybe some you know investment in in that development now simply saying oh then we'll do it it sounds like lip service again to me there's no true understanding of the nuance required to go through that process just give it to us and we'll stamp it i'm all for the change but every politician has said this and yet here we remain in this jurisdictional nightmare me you and me have to end up dealing with it yeah exactly it's like okay focus on where the true problem is right yes we know the bottleneck is essentially at the city halls here right what is it? the approval process time is so long so understand why it takes so long and then fix that right the sort of bully mentality of like oh if they don't just do it sure we'll rubber stamp it like walk me through that like Okay, so I'm in Revelstoke and my, you know, plans for a McMansion uh, aren't getting approved yet and they're wanting some changes. And so all of a sudden that goes to what, Victoria or, or Vancouver City Hall for their team that's just waiting in the wings that have all this understanding of the building permit process and they're just going to stamp it. So all of a sudden this approval that should, or the, sorry, this, these plans, it probably should never have been approved in the first place because it's atrocious you know, work with me here, um, are now just going to be rubber stamped by, you know, this person in Victoria for this home in Revelstoke or, or wherever. You get the idea, right? It's just such a flawed vision of this, right? You can't just bully somebody into it. It would have potentially disastrous outcomes and, and properties that could be essentially improved in that format. So again, yes, we're 100% for improving the process, 100% for going faster, but the plan needs a little bit more work, I think. I mean, think about it from um, an engineering perspective. If you're a, a city of Vancouver engineer and you get hired to do some work in Abbotsford, yeah, they're going to have a whole different set of standards to work by. That engineer, you, you wouldn't just hire that engineer in Vancouver to do the work in Abbotsford. You'd hire someone in Abbotsford who understands that better than anybody else. And that's kind of the, the, the piece that feels missing here. There's no detail in how this is actually going to transpire. And it's not a clear, sound understanding of the nuances or the process required. Next up, let's look at uh, what they're requiring for zoning to be proactive, because this to me sounds like some regurgitation of a plan we already have. What they're saying is we will work with cities to ensure that zoning is changed at the same time as other land use policies in what is sometimes referred to as pre-zoning. Even though official community plans and area plans already specify what type of buildings are to be encouraged, cities still require unique rezoning for each building. And this adds years of delay that we can't afford. Well, isn't that the plan that David Eby has already done? This is just a more complicated version of it. It's slower than Bill 44 and Bill 47 that is already in place with hundreds of applications that are coming. There's about, I think I was, I think I heard yesterday is 212 multiplex applications in place right now at the city of Vancouver. It's a thousand homes, right? So we're, we're, we're already going to repeal that. I thought we we're in a housing crisis. Creating one zone for all these single family lots is incredibly proactive and it's such a huge time saver for builders and, and for the most part you know the feedback that we've received within the industry is that they love it it's great you know it's faster for city hall as well the time that's been sort of fast tracked uh, at all the areas of the bottleneck has improved by the current legislation that has rezoned single family lots so kind of going backwards there i mean my goodness i think it would just be um, a really really bad idea to to undo what is already working can I add one thing to that, Dan? Um, they've talked about adding, or, or, or I guess modifying this plan so that two thirds of, of the area get affected by this, as opposed to a sweeping plan like EB has done. The thing that EB has done is that's potentially one of the most deregulatory uh, changes made to the housing industry that we've ever seen. That is very pro business. That is. There's some problems with it. We'll get into that a little bit later. But when you decide to change that plan and go to two thirds of the area, sure, you seem to satisfy some of the people who don't want this in their backyard. But what ends up happening is you create a part of the city that has huge density and parts of the city that don't. There's, you know, back in the, you go back 30 years down in the States and you had this uh, program of redlining that was happening at city halls where they were deciding what parts of the city would be designated for 
certain people and certain demographics. That sounds a little similar to this. It doesn't work. It creates bad neighborhoods, and good neighborhoods. It doesn't help the entire area. So I don't think that's a really good idea, much like you, Dan, I'm echoing that sentiment. I think that, that uh, it's okay if you're campaign campaigning against somebody that you can also agree with some of the things that they have done. It doesn't have to be taking this position because you have to take an opposite position to what they already have. There's nothing wrong with saying this is a great plan. Let's lower maybe the tax the effective tax rates inside of this plan. Get a bit more lean with it. So anyways. Yeah, a lot of it should be that the best idea wins. You know, and so much in politics it just seems like, well, it was his idea, so let's yeah. get rid of it. Or it was her idea, so let's get rid of it, whatever the case is. But yes, um, we'll see how this pans out. But let's now look at their uh building policies. And and I'll say this one sort of verbatim here. Remove the NDP taxes on housing. The NDP is increasing construction costs by 30 to 40 percent in the middle of a housing crisis. This hidden tax called the step code also results in dark cookie cutter homes with few windows and diminished quality of life for residents. We will immediately repeal the step code, the radical net zero mandate, and all other NDP hidden taxes on housing. Okay, so I personally need a bit of clarification on this, right? Because the quote construction costs are not clearly defined. Uh, but let's maybe assume that we're talking about city taxes, the DCCs, CACs, permit fees. Um, as we know, if you take all taxes and fees in, they do equate to about a third of the cost of a new home. Okay, that's all fees and all taxes. If they were able to remove all taxes, as they're kind of quoting here, that would equal about a $420,000 price reduction on a typical Vancouver home. $420,000, right? Because we're talking about a 1.2 on average million dollar home here. Now, wouldn't that be the largest tax cut on housing in BC's history? Not a hundred bucks a month. We're talking, you know, 400K here. Um, that sounds, that's what the rust at rebate should be. Anyway, so, you know, for, for me, this is already not adding up, but as usual, right? They kind of have great ideas, but then the devil's in the details, but the devil is yet to be seen here. So the promise is, is it's vague at best, right? Like, is he removing the entire 30 to 40% of housing construction costs? I mean, that would be the absolute biggest game changer of all time in creating affordability and something we're 100% for. I mean, we keep saying they, they come up with these rebates and demand side policies, but removing the city fees or at least as much as they can of the third of the cost of a home would dramatically create more affordable homes and, and quite quickly here. I mean, we talk about this extensively. Um, I can't imagine this is what he means. There's no way he has the ability to remove all taxes, right? So how much and which ones exactly are being removed? Um, there's no mention of like f uh, preventing or putting up these roadblocks for further taxes to be created, right? Like often we see one proactive policy come into place just to see another group just basically add that back in, right? For example, we saw uh, development permits not required in Burnaby, but Burnaby then also added extra fees. So they saved you a bunch of money here, but they kind of took it back over here at a different level. So, I mean, the Rust out rebate, I mean, there, there were hard numbers, there were hard dates. It was great, right? I, I love that part of it, but this plan really, it's lacking specifics and, and details here. They didn't even say how much of this reduction of the taxes would actually change the price of a home. And that's like, my numbers are right here that, you know, the full reduction of these 30 to 40% of cost of construction do reduce the price of a home that much. I mean, come on, this is, this was the first thing I would lead with if I was a politician, if I had this promise out there. So, you know, there's immense potential here, but, um, you know, so is almost every campaign promise, but I'd, I'd love to see specifics here. And while you're so focused on the enemy here, right, while you're cutting NDP taxes, yeah, I don't know, cut some conservative ones as well. Maybe the GST, right? That was created by a conservative government in 1991. Cutting the cost of GST on new homes would immediately and instantly reduce the cost of a new home by 5%. That helps affordability. Plus, you know, please add that one to your campaign promise. Ryan, what's your take on this? Why not, why not reduce it by even 3%, 2%? you'd still have a meaningful tax cut. It doesn't have to be all of the GST. I get that we have to pay for nice things like 
you know, boulevards, and trees and functioning government, healthcare, all of that stuff. We need to fund all of that. I get that. But at the same time, some of this could be, you know, I guess better thought out. I, one of the things that kind of crosses my mind is, you know, and, and just say what you will, you know, one way that you could allow people to get into the properties a little bit easier would be to lower those effective purchase purchase tax rates, right? Whether it's GST, whether it's property transfer tax, whatever it is, maybe change the scale. But why not increase property taxes on the other side, right? So maybe you double property taxes. You take out the taxes of the development costs so that it's easier to actually buy the property. Yeah, you got to spend more to own it, but at least you get to buy it. Uh, and, and maybe on the flip side, you could in- continue to increase property taxes, but have it come out of the income side of your taxes as well. There's lots of different ideas, ways to balance this that would work better for cash flow and for other people. Uh, but you know, kind of just going through the 3% adjustment here on the step code and then calling it all NDP taxes, it, it sounds uh, more political than it does solution-minded. So anyhow, uh, let's get into uh, the transit-oriented areas here. So I'm going to verbatim state what they've, what they've had here. Uh, support transit-oriented communities. People deserve to live in complete communities near transit not just dormitories. Bill 47, transit-oriented areas, will be amended to ensure each new transit-oriented community is providing space for grocery stores and small businesses within walking distance of a home. I find this one missing the mark as developers already do master plan communities. Uh, This is something that they spend millions of dollars designing, and it's already something that they do. So I don't quite understand how this is a new promise when this is just piggybacking off of the requirements of, you know, like a BOSA, for example, has to build a master plan community in in a place like Surrey. They're going to put four towers up. They have to include all kinds of residential, commercial, um, and uh, and rental options, right? This, This kind of already exists. Quite often, commercial agreements with amenity providers are secured prior to even putting shovels in the ground. Savon will come in and be an anchor tenant for your development once it's done. This is already stuff that happens. So this is just an example of how I think, uh, you know, not realistically thought out this is. Uh, You know, living next to a grocery store just because you can walk to it doesn't make it more affordable, in my mind. it doesn't change the cost of, of the housing. Moving on to what they call overregulation now, let's read what that policy is about. To end overregulation, NDP aligned city planners inflate the price of housing by overstepping their role, such as by requiring endless design reviews or by forcing builders to give away brand new homes. These are heavy taxes on new housing and they kill projects. Often, only the expensive ones can survive. We will amend the Local Government Act to prevent home killing red tape. Okay, part of this is absolutely true. I mean, the the regulation to have a builder um, have to give away 20% of their properties that they build to the city is, is absolutely a development killer. So getting rid of that, I'm all for. Um, I don't know how many people are, are requiring endless design reviews. That just seems... Uh, Again, a little bit bully-minded, but the idea and the intent here is, is quite good on paper. Um, we'd love to see more details as always. And, um, but ultimately, yes, get rid of red tape, right? We see this all the time. And uh, again, asking a developer to give up 20% of their potential revenue. I mean, imagine going into anything in, in, in the private sector and say, okay, cool. Just give us 20% more, <laughs> I guess, of your revenue uh, outside of what they already tax, right? Again, people would just give up and, and leave. So uh, overregulation, get rid of it. I'm absolutely for this. I think this is uh, a step in the right direction. I agree. Uh, you you got to consider too, uh, how many times have you heard down South that they intend to build over the next four years, 3.9 million homes? If you're a developer, and you hear that kind of announcement coming out of the U.S., and you are up here looking at this development, and you've got to give away 20% of what you're building just so that you can get your your ideas approved, you're going to lose that developer. They're going to go to a different market where they don't have to do that. So we have to get more competitive here. This this idea of giving these units back to the city doesn't work. Uh, And we're in a housing crisis. We need 
a volume of homes. The more available homes that come to market, the more price stabilization we're going to get. So there should be incentive around this. But anyhow, I digress. Let's go to the reform, reforming DCCs. So the reform of development cost charges allow DCCs to be paid upon project completion, not as a front-loaded cost. We will also take action to prevent DCCs from being set at rates in excess of the growth pays for growth principle. Hold on a second. So wait, you're going to remove all NDP taxes, not just the ones of the largest development prohibitors in place, growing DCCs. Just deferring them? It doesn't change the cost of housing. That just pushes it over to that end of the equation as opposed to this end of the equation. Maybe it helps stimulate some construction, but at the end of the day, the fees have to get paid. You, you can't say construction fees are 30 to 40% and not be including DCCs. There's no plan to lowering these fees. Part of their plan though is in regards to property tax. And while it's of course not lowering, it is somewhat kind of maintaining it. And that comes when their property is rezoned, like we've seen recently. And if you're sitting on like a nice little single family lot, and then all of a sudden you're rezoned for a 20 uh, story tower, well, your land becomes more valuable and uh, they're taxing accordingly. And their plan here is to essentially say that um, you will not get hit with higher tax bills based on the future potential of your lot. Uh, so it would kind of keep people's tax payments in their property somewhat stable, which of course I am absolutely for. I think this is a good idea. Uh, let's touch on uh, building new towns. This is interesting. BC is blessed with an abundance of land, but the NDP refused to use it to end the housing shortage. We will identify land outside the agricultural land reserve that has the potential to support beautiful new communities. I've, I've been calling for uh, you know, the announcement of, of the construction of new communities for a long time. But we need some specifics to prove it. And, and one thing I will say, you know, uh, Dan, if you go back like 30 or 40 years when new home construction was taking place in the country, new homes were actually cheaper than established homes. That was a thing because you were buying a new home in a neighborhood that didn't have old growth trees. Maybe the sidewalks weren't in there yet, uh, but you did get a brand new home. They were discounted for that reason. Whereas now they are arguably the most expensive because the only thing we have left is to build new homes in established neighborhoods. And that's like, that, that, that's a double, double whammy. So yes, the announcement of let's unlock some of this land and start building new communities, all for that. But where, when, how, how many homes? So much that needs to be developed with this idea. Yeah, the idea is good. I always had this vision of like the uh, the fast train, right? You jump on a fast train, 45 minutes later, you're maybe 200 kilometers away in this beautiful valley and they can build that out and be this, you know, 100,000, 200,000, half million person city community and be able to build and provide housing at half the cost. Anyway, bit of a pipe dream, but hey, ultimately, yes, yes, open up the land for sure. It is, we are an abundant land rich uh, country. So I, I would love to see someone be able to take the power to be able to develop it. Moving along and now talking about working with the cities, right? We're talking about a provincial government. So how do they interact with the cities? Well, first off, they're going to repeal Bill 44. Local government needs to, sorry, I'm going to read this verbatim. Local government needs the flexibility to plan in the way that works best for their communities. We will work with cities, not against them, to build the housing BC needs. Some municipalities support the provisions of Bill 44, and we will continue to assist them in implementation. Okay, <laughs> this one's a little funny, right? So it's like, hey, we're going to repeal it because that guy came up with the idea, so I don't like it. But those communities that like it, oh, of course, they get full support because it's actually a good idea. It's really quite bizarre. And ultimately, they're just, what, going to name it something different? Like, talking about what giving cities their own power is just going to bring us back to the status quo, right? Cities have always had their own power, and here we are in a housing crisis. And you're saying, well, let's give them back the power that we kind of took away, pushed down on the cities, saw the 212-odd uh, building plans get into place, have a thousand homes being built right now. 
um, but saying, no, 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 let's go back to where we were when it was, you know, more troublesome. So this sounds completely backwards to me, um, you know, e even with Bill 44 in place. I mean, there's only so many cities that have even adopted this, right? It's, it's not a, a guarantee. It's been tough. I mean, even the uh, city of Coquitlam have been able to get a, a deferral until June of 2025 to implement this, right? So even with the province and the current uh, group in power, party in power, quote unquote, forcing cities to rezone and be able to allow multifamily uh, units or buildings go up on single family lots, it's still very challenging. And so we've seen the amount of pushback that comes from this. And so what we're basically saying is, okay, yeah, it's fine. Uh, we'll give you all the power again, which essentially means they don't want to densify, right? We're, we're, we're witnessing this in real time today. So I, I just don't see how this helps, right? The, the reason this Bill 44 came into place is because the cities independently were not providing housing. And the gov provincial government is like, enough is enough. We have to provide housing for people. And this is what it looks like. And of course, in a few cities, it's absolutely working. And the ones that are pushing back are pushing back. And this is essentially giving them, all the cities, again, more power just to say, no, no, thanks. We'll, we'll, we're good with the status quo. And we'll just keep these prices high. I, I think it nailed that, Dan. Um, honestly speaking, uh, it, it, it's like, a, it, I understand that returning sovereignty to the authority uh, or the governing body is a conservative value. Uh, but at the end of the day, it does not address the specific problems that exist within BC, specifically to the housing issue. It, 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 it doesn't. That needs to be, there needs to be radical moves because, because of the lack of housing that has been approved over the last 30 to 40 years. If anything, we have a track record. And if we just do the same thing we've always done, expecting a different result, we know that's the definition of insanity. So while I appreciate the conservative value trying to be promoted here or respected, it does not address the problem that we have here in BC. Let's move on to infrastructure. Create the Civil Infrastructure Renewal Fund, a $1 billion per year fund that will be available to municipalities who are taking action to get homes built. The funds will be available to municipalities whose zoning allows for viable small-scale multi-unit housing on at least two-thirds of residential land. Okay, so this is a billion-dollar fund. First of all, where is it coming from? Is this adding to the projected $9 billion deficit? Because if we're just going to print more money and create more debt without making a cut somewhere else, I, I, I don't know. Just sounds like more tax to me. What's more is you've removed 40% of taxes on homes from your previous plan and claim. Great. So where's the new revenue coming from? It's, this is, you can't just print the money. It needs to come from somewhere. So until we understand where that's coming from, again, this is kind of dangerous. Sounds like a lot of promises. And again, touching on that two thirds of residential land, I mean, I spoke about it before, but that, you know, that's effectively redlining communities and saying, you know what, we're going to protect this community from any kind of uh, residential redevelopment. And but this one over here, this one's going to get all of it. You, you'll end up creating communities that have massive income disparity. You'll have, you know, huge densification problems in one area that infrastructure cannot deal with, or you'll have other infrastructure upgrades in areas that don't have the volume of people in it, and those costs will be exorbitant by comparison as well. Why not simplify the process and respect the one that's already in place? It's a better idea, and that's just the gist of it. Next up, they've made mention of what is called low barrier facilities, and, and they want to stop, quote, ramming through low barrier facilities into communities that don't want them, okay? We will never force any kind of low barrier housing or shelter on a community that doesn't want it. While many are good neighbors, some have disastrous impacts. No one should have to worry about Victoria dictating that a risky facility gets built next door. Okay, so they're obviously talking about, you know, these sort of low income houses, these, these support shelters for people that are, are, are um, working essentially through rehab or having sobriety requirements, etc. And, and yeah, when you see these getting sort of popping up in places, I don't know, like Point Grey, for example, or Shaughnessy, yes, there, there's pushback, right? And this is just saying nimbyism wins. Okay, you don't want it, not a problem at all. 
uh, it's a touchy subject, obviously, right? But ultimately, which communities say, yes, we, we want low barrier housing. We really want to build a facility or a shelter in our, in our backyard to help these people. It's Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a very low amount. And when we look at this policy, all he's saying really is that if you don't want it, no problem, but no plan to say where they are going to build them and how we can help this demographic of our population here. So it's, it's a bit of just like, yeah, don't worry. Um, we're not going to put that type of demographic in your backyard, but um, where they go, well, we're not even going to address it at this point. Yeah. I, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> rental construction. So unlike condominiums, rental buildings, and this is verbatim, pay back builders over a time span of 50 to 60 years, but the cost for these buildings are front loaded. The successful MURB tax incentive program, the multi-unit residential building from 1974 to 1982 created a strong supply of rental housing by allowing costs to offset taxable income from other sources. A housing crisis calls for bold, creative solutions. And the Conservative Party of BC will introduce real tax incentives from rental construction. We will work with the federal government to reduce a MURB tax incentive program for the 21st century. If Ottawa doesn't want to play ball, we will introduce a made in BC version. Yes, this is good. Uh, though, you know, CMHC already provides a lot of this where you can get into some funding for something like this with only 5% down. Uh, that'll change, you know, it'll be, I think it's moving to 10%. But anyways, the point being is that there's, there are some incentives that already exist for this. But again, just writing a check with no outline of where this money kind of comes from, it's, it's, just, it's just more promises without any sort of validity. If, if you come out and, and have these sort of ideas of, of where you're going to change things, you have to ha show the back end. You have to show the work. And, and I just, I don't see it. The last one we're going to touch on today is accountability. And they quote here, conduct a forensic audit into BC housing. The audit will include its relationship with po politically connected nonprofits. I mean, yes, great. Accountability within government is absolutely fundamentally important. And right now I, I feel it is well underutilized. Um, so yes, love it. Go, but definitely go further here. Okay. Like let's, let's see where all these funds within housing are going, right? Are we sure DCCs are going to where they are meant to go? Are communities improving to the degree that they should? Uh, are taxes that are charged for all these developers going back into the community to help the neighborhoods? We're seeing billions being spent here. And uh, at times it doesn't feel like we're seeing the results. Now, ultimately, you know, it's a plan. It's pretty lengthy here, right? We've been going on about this plan for about 40 minutes and, and there were there were other elements too, but we these we felt were the most important to talk about. And sure, you know, some great ideas, some sort of left field ideas here too, and some that are just pointless, but ultimately I think I give this plan maybe like a, a C, C minus even, you know? But again, when you lack specifics, you lack clarity, it's all just the same rhetoric ultimately, right? It feels like another politician who thinks the spending coffers are, are bottomless and, and it kind of there's some elements here that shows that he lacks true understanding of how housing in our province works or well doesn't work so um we'll see how the ndp stacks up against this next week uh, but overall you know I, I don't see anything revolutionized or revolutionary here excuse me that that's going to move the needle on affordable housing yeah you know i i think uh i probably align a little bit more with fiscal conservatives than I do with uh, you know any other party but I'm not I'm not impressed with this uh, in fact I'm more impressed with what the NDP has done from a conservative from a fiscally conservative perspective when it comes to the you know province-wide rezoning uh, specific to that you know I I just uh, I think if you're going to be a really good leader you have to have a very sound understanding of how something works that's the only way you're going to fix it and I'm just not convinced here that this plan either has enough, has recognized uh, sort of the, the, the problems that exist within, within BC, especially for younger people. And if we're going to consider becoming more productive as a nation, uh, then we need better reform than this. This is not uh, enough reform from the Conservative Party that I would have liked to have seen. 
Uh, it just, um, we're not talking about, you know, big tax cuts. We're not talking about how to bring the cost of our budget down. Uh, we're, you know, it's, it's just not good enough. And I'm, I'm not convinced that the NDP platform will be any better. Uh, it's just, people are really afraid of change and change is what we need more than anything right now. So we know politics are a very divisive conversation and hey, maybe we've already lost half of our followers here by getting into <laughs> it, but uh, it was all about housing and we felt it was important to address and thank you for making it this far. And, and now we're going to get into maybe what you're also following us for. And that's of course uh, the Vancouver real estate stats data because it moves so much month to month. And now we're going to get into the September numbers for you. And as always, we love to start off with the sales volumes, right? What's the health of the market? And to, to sound like a broken record, I mean, it is a dead on the table kind of slow, slow market here. We only saw about 1,850 homes sell in September. Year over year, well, it was slow last year too, right? It did drop, but only about 4% and uh, down about 3% month over month because last month was slow too. But ultimately, um, <clears throat> we've now seen month over month sales volumes decline for five months in a row. And when we look at that 10 year big picture, sales are like 26% below that long term 10 year average. So it looks like we will not see any type of a fall market in 2024, right? Normally we see an uptick in September and a bit in October, and that's just not taking place this year. So we do have a Bank of Canada rate announcement at the end of this month. And even if they come forward with a 50 basis point cut, I mean, that's going right into November. And I don't think that's going to move the needle. Not too many people are really planning on, on home hunting in the month of November here. Um, oddly enough, the last two years saw an increase in sales in October over September. So there might be a blip, but we're not talking about any type of real needle mover here. Yeah. And I, I think when you compound that with the new jobs report out of the US today, where they added 254,000 jobs, the chances of an oversized rate cut from the US Fed diminished quite a bit, which unfortunately will reduce the opportunity for Canada. If Canada does a big rate cut, uh, a 50 point basis cut, it does risk importing inflation from the US. It does risk uh, currency debasement and some other things as well. So it makes it a bit more complicated for the Bank of Canada when you hear such a robust jobs report down south as well. Uh, let's get into new listings here. There were 6,144 new listings. It's a 13% increase year over year, 49% increase month over month. So it's your sellers come into the marketplace expecting to see a fall market and then not getting one. 17% above the 10 year seasonal average. You've got 25% below in terms of sales and 17% in terms of increase in terms of new listings. Do note that every September does see an increase month over month. And this goes back as far as the data goes. So don't be too alarmed by that, but this is a big number. Okay. So with an almost 50% increase in new listings month over month, that must mean that inventory has skyrocketed, right? Well, it actually hasn't. It hasn't. And I'll get into the specifics right now. Um, and of course, why? Why didn't it spike? Well, it really looks like this month, or sorry, well, this month being September that we're discussing, it really looks like there was a heck of a lot of homes, properties that were delisted at the end of the month. Because of course, people saw at the end of September, they're like, why is no one coming to our open house? Why aren't we getting any offers? Or why are we getting low balls? Whatever's happening. There was such little movement in September. I think a lot of people decided to take their homes off the market and say, okay, well, let's try again in spring because we're, we'll likely see a bunch more rate cuts by then. Maybe there'll be a better market by then. Because August to September only saw a 3% increase in inventory. 3%. 50% increase in, in listings, but only 3% increase in inventory by the time the numbers washed out at the end of the month, right? We ended the month of, of September with only 14,350 listings. There were actually more active listings in July this year than September. And we are still under that 15,000 ceiling. You have to go back five years to see inventory over 15,000. Now, inventory is up overall, no question about it. When we look at the year to year, we're up almost 30% year over year. So there's definitely more listings than a year ago. But listings have basic, like active inventory rather, have been basically the same for almost three months here, right? So there's been no spike since we increased three months ago. 
uh, overall, it's still high compared to that long-term average though as well, right? Like 24% above the 10-year average. Uh, but here's kind of another interesting element or a nuance about the current inventory is that even with 24% more inventory than the 10-year average, most of it is not great. You know, like our team right now has 15 active listings and we'll be honest, the activity is much lower than we would typically see. And what's more, the team probably has what, Ryan, 30 odd active buyers right now, pre-approved, qualified, out there looking, putting out offers, that kind of thing. And some of them have budgets as high as $3 million. And most of them, they just don't like what's out there. You know, for most, it's, it's not even an affordability within our group of, of buyers right now, but it's the lack of decent inventory. There's a lot of homes out there that just, they're not getting traction because they're not great. I think the, the good ones are sort of being held back or people are just living in those homes because they are nice. Well, and, and you, you, you got to remember, 40 to 50% of houses in Vancouver do not have a mortgage. And so they are not pressured to sell in a downward market. Chances of that actually taking place are low. What's more is anyone who has that kind of situation or has a mortgage that they are they can afford, why would they put their listing up in a bad market? Right. So the quality of those listings, the savvy sellers, if you will, the people who don't have to sell, the people who own those properties and have owned them for a long time, they're not coming to the market in, in this environment. They're going to wait either until the spring or fall of next year when the market has more activity and when the cost of capital is much lower, allowing people to spend more. That's arguably why I think we're not seeing you know, really good quality listings out there. Some you do find, you know, they do pop up once in a while, but for the most part, they're not there. Let's look at the sales to active ratio here. Overall, we're looking at 13%. We're down 1% month over month. That's the sixth, sixth monthly drop in a row. This is the sentiment of the market, right? Fourth month in a balanced market. This is the lowest reading since January of 2023, which lasted one month as this ratio, before the ratio shot up to 36% within four months. So to kind of break it down by asset class here, you're looking at 9% for a detached, for the detached market. That's the same as it was last month, but ultimately this is creating a trend of a buyer's market inside the single family home designation. 19% for townhomes, this is actually up 2%. And again, I think this will maintain, this is going to be what people are buying the most of. This is how they get into their neighborhood, but not having to pay for a single family home. It adds the most utility. It's the most family friendly option right now. 15% for apartments, this is down 2%. And that's due in part to likely the uh, amount of condos that are available. A lot of competition among sellers here. Let's get into price. The HPI saw its fourth monthly decline in a row in September. But what's more, HPI dropped the largest amount that we've seen this year. It dropped one and a half percent month over month. And that's a significant amount. I mean, annualize that, right? That starts to get into a big number. Should it uh, consistently drop at that rate? Year over year, it's almost the same, actually. So year over year, we're down about 1.8%. Not much, but all declines, of course, or all gains, rather, from the year are, are now erased. The HPI price for the home, average home in, in Vancouver now, $1,180,000. How does that compare to that good old April 22 uh, peak? Home prices are down 7% since then, 7%. Okay, now let's move over to the other two price metrics here. Next up is median. Median's down. Again, down 20K last month, now sitting at $925,000. Also the fourth monthly decline and down 70 grand in just four months. That metric is back to like uh, August 2023 prices. And interestingly, also down exactly 7% from the 2022 peak. Ending on average now, average prices somehow went up last month, just a little bit though, 3K. Average home price, 1,255,000. Also down 7% from the 2022 peak. So there you go. We've got two and a half years of data. Sorry, almost just over two and a half. Yeah, almost two and a half years of data since the peak, the all time blow off top. And even though we've had two and a half years of increasing interest rates, home prices have been pretty resilient if you consider 7%, not that big of a hit, uh, especially when we look to areas like Toronto, which have seen much deeper declines. 
Yeah, and there's all kinds of reasons for that too, but we won't get into it. But days on days on market here are sitting at 19. It's actually down two, but a bit of a nominal change. Not much to really comment on here. You're taking about three weeks to sell your house uh, for an average price home. If you're sitting on the market for more than three weeks, it's time to have that conversation about price or like the stats have been indicating, maybe try a different market too. Perfect. Thank you so much for watching and listening. One last announcement today. Uh, so on this Sunday, the upcoming October the 6th, um, there is an investor summit taking place in Yale Town. Uh, it's located at the Earls. Uh, there's like a loft area upstairs. It's really quite nice. We've uh, spoke at a couple events there historically. There's another one upcoming. If you are interested in investing in Canadian real estate, specifically on the West Coast, uh, there's about five or six different speakers um, presenting opportunities. Ryan and myself are going to be talking about the multiplex and how and where you can capitalize on the rezoning that has taken place and run out pro forma to show you the type of money that can actually be made if you are targeting the correct lots in the correct cities. Uh, it's only 20 bucks and it comes with a brunch, including mimosas, it's kind of a no brainer. Uh, there's only 19 tickets left though. We will leave the link uh, below here. If you want to click on that, you can attend in person or if you would rather watch on Zoom, that is free. We will include that link as well. Uh, about 400 people so far have registered and we're really looking forward to, to sharing some information and, and hearing other investors share where they are seeing opportunities within the real estate landscape. There we have it. Thanks as always for tuning in, watching and listening. We'll be here next week to dissect the NDP's platform on housing and, and give our thoughts therein. Have a great weekend and we'll see you here next week.